Welcome everybody to our Behind the Fluff, Inspiring the Next CMO podcast series. Now you can find lots of great resources on our website, www.internationalbranch.com forward slash be inspired. Now today I would like to welcome Paula Neary. Now Paula is an industry CEO in publishing automation. It's a fascinating subject area and one I know that's very much of interest to everyone at the moment. And Paula has an extensive career in providing strategic solutions within the publishing industry. Now, I recently met Paula at a session that I was helping to chair about marketing automation. And I learned that Paula and I certainly have some areas that are very close to our heart, which is about a passion for driving positive progression um, in the industry and in teams. So hello, Paula. Hello, Lou. Thank you so much for asking me today. Absolute pleasure. I'm very excited about this one, as I mentioned to you just before. So what we're going to do is we're going to first begin with our usual question, which is where we say we'd like to ask you what your favorite word is, because we have a campaign that we do where we celebrate um, a hashtag int bunch word of the day every week. So we'd love to know what is your favorite word and why? Well, my favorite word is myriad. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's been one of your chosen no. words. Ah. Uh, well, it means a great number of people or things. And it's been in use in the English language since about 16th century. So I think it used to mean precisely 10,000. And then gradually it morphed into a more sort of generic, you know, just countless or large number of things. And I, I love the sound of it. And I think it, it makes me feel very positive. It sounds like brightness and abundance. And uh, I use this word quite a lot, actually. Fantastic. Uh, well, and I, I, I find myself um, sometimes using it actually with publishers um, to talk about their myriad of legacy systems, which is quite funny because I, you know, I sometimes use it around positive sets of lots of things and then around some negative sets of lots of things because it kind of takes away a bit of a tinge of criticism there. So, you know, it's not great that you've got a myriad of legacy systems, but it's not so bad. A myriad of legacy systems and a myriad of places that your content or your data is stored in your contacts. Absolutely. I think everyone at some point in their career can absolutely, that probably resonates with them. (laughs) (laughs) It's such a good word, though. We are definitely going to feature that. Oh, good. Thank you. (laughs) Okay, so first things first. Now, we want to know a little more about you before we get into the more professional stuff. Mm -hmm. So what is the best thing that you have discovered in this last year that we've had such a odd time of a pandemic for those that may be watching this content some years in the future they'll be like why the last year or even 18 months (laughs) yeah it's been incredibly odd hasn't it the last year um and if i'm allowed there's a couple of things um okay thank you so one of them is podcasts and i know a lot of people have found podcasts in the last year and I really now love them. And I've got a favorite one apart from this one, Lou, obviously. (laughs) Um, And it's called Today in Focus. I don't know if you've come across it. So it's a a daily podcast and it's got a couple of my favorite journalists hosting it. One of them is Anushka Astana and they cover topical subjects. So, you know, one day, Well, recently it was on Matt Hancock's downfall and resignation. Another day it's on climate change. It could be on, um, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, Grenfell Tower and how the whole cladding crisis is unsolved. So, yeah, it's um, it's very interesting. Yeah, it it is. Actually, it's probably a great way of um, keeping up to date with what's going on, but also having that snippet of in-depth conversation as well. So that's definitely going to go on my list. Oh, good. Yeah, take a look at it. And I, I'll listen to it in the evening with an eye compress on because I don't know about you, but, you know, we're sitting in front of a screen literally all day, aren't we? And we're having meetings now on a screen where normally, 
you know, we'd be, I don't know, sitting in an office together without a screen and my eyes just feel so tired. So I'll put a kind of hot eye compress on and listen to a podcast. A I would recommend. Question. They're also, um, I know that, yeah, as you mentioned, a lot of people have really found podcasts in the last year. And especially, I think, because I think so many people have been looking for content that's really digestible. And the really mm. nice thing about that kind of content um, is that you can go for a walk and you can listen to it in headphones. And I go running and I listen to mm. I listen to podcasts in one headphone. I mean, there are some out there. I, I kind of sometimes like to have humorous ones because, um, you know, when you're doing so much work all day, you just want a bit of a, you know, step out mm. of reality, don't you, every now and again? Yeah, you do. And it's funny you mentioned running, though, Lou, because that's my other one that I've discovered. Not so much discovered running because I've been doing it for years, but I've discovered I love it. So do you, are you a serious runner? I think you probably are. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's a relief because I'm not. No, I am. Um, I'm on this. I'm part of this. Um, there's a Facebook group called Badass Mother Runners. And actually, Bev, who runs it, she is um, local to me here in Wales. And um, she was a brand manager. And she, I think she was made redundant. So she's doing it full time now. And this group has exploded. And it's for anyone of any type of ability. And you don't have to be a mother. Um, but it's an incredibly supportive group. And I think probably it is that you have to be a woman. Um, mm -hmm. That's um, the only probably criteria of it, but everyone's so supportive. It's not about the time it takes you to do something. It's the fact that you've actually gone and done it. Mm. So yeah, I think running's a great way to sort of um, just have time to yourself, isn't it? That rare yeah. time that you get. Yeah, no, I love it. I, I it used to be, if I'm honest, a chore. So I've been doing it for years, as I say, but then I learned to really embrace it. I guess it was something we were encouraged to do over lockdown and just getting out of the house, being in that moment. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my partner and I tend to go running together. We engineered it so we'd end up at our favorite cafe or our newly discovered favorite cafe. So we'd have the run and then we'd have you know, a cup of tea and a cake. And this was astonishing because one took that for granted. But then suddenly, you know, cafes were open for a takeaway and then they were open to sit down at. And there was this joy around this whole event. It was the highlight of my week, the run and the tea and the cake at the cafe. <laughs> so newfound small joys, I would say. Absolutely. And, uh, I, I, and one thing Bev has done really well is merchandise. So it's amazing how you start buying into, you know, wanting to have a top that says badass on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. But yeah, I mean, it's, I think you're right. Just getting out there and just breathing the air and just having that time to yourself. Or like you said, you know, running with your partner, having that time together. Are they a bit faster than you, slower than you, same? Uh, we're about the same. So it's, yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. We don't chat when we're running because I don't think we'd be capable of that. But breathing. the company, yeah, the company <laughs> is lovely. <laughs> oh, excellent. I love it. So, Paula, who inspires you? Yeah, this is a really interesting question. And, and again, I'm being a bit greedy because there are some work people um, that inspire me. And then there are, you know, historical figures, movements, current figures who are taking a stand to inspire me. But I was thinking about it from a work perspective. And do you know Jill Jones? Have you come across Jill? So she, I suppose, most latterly was CEO of McGraw-Hill, um, McGraw EMA, yeah. um, UK and EMA. And prior to that, Cengage. But we met years ago at what was Longman, and Longman eventually morphed into Pearson Education. And, um, oh, I just think Jill is fantastic. We worked on lots of projects together, including the first ebook list for the company. So this is a long time ago here. I think it was about 2000. Yeah. And that ebook list was the revision study guides, York Notes. And Jill is, well, she's really intelligent, really focused on getting a job done. She's not risk averse. So I think she realizes if you want to make a significant leap forward, you can't be risk averse. And I admire that. But the thing I most admire is her character, really, and how she treats people, everybody, uh, very respectfully. And 
I really noticed in meetings, she would look out for junior staff. And at that time, I was junior staff, you know, making sure you felt comfortable, that you were able to voice your opinion. Um, you know, you didn't feel out of your depth. Just a really, really lovely woman, but incredibly bright and incredibly driven. Yeah. And so she sprang to mind immediately. And another one is Annette Thomas. Have you come across Annette? Yeah. So she was CEO of Macmillan Science and Education. And very similar reasons, you know, so bright, it's incredible, so driven. Uh, and she increased revenue at Nature tenfold before she became CEO wow. of, of MSC. So, you know, a one, wonderful woman, a wonderful career. But again, I'd go and present to her at a board meeting. She'd be in the meeting all day. She'd have hundreds of people presenting. But at eight o'clock at night, by the time she got home, she would still email, you know, to thank me. I'm sure she was doing it to everyone for the effort that I'd put in and the team had put in. And I just, I just really love that, that they're really both very rounded characters. They sound absolutely fascinating people. And I love what you said in terms of that care and attention of recognizing different people in the room, regardless of their experience, their expertise, their level, but also because you're ultimately going to get the best out of those people during that meeting. Um, so that's an incredibly special and not something actually you hear of often. Mm -hmm. um, now, because I do live in Wales, and you would expect this, a tractor just has to go by, right? <laughs> Of course. Well, you know, that's another thing we've got in common, don't you? I, I was right. born and brought up in Wales. Did I tell you that? No, but I did read that somewhere, actually. And uh. I was like, how have we not had this? <laughs> <laughs> so I am empathetic to the tractor. <laughs> I'm actually a farmer's daughter, so I'm very used to it. Uh. But our farm's in Cambridge in England. Mm. So I'm a long way away from, from our you know, farm tractors. Be a bit odd if I saw one here. Probably take yeah. about 10 hours to drive down here. <laughs> so um, yeah. when you were young, what did you, what did you want to be? Well, when I was a really young child, I can't remember that there was a particular thing. But when I was a teenager and in my early 20s, I wanted to be a psychologist, uh, specifically a clinical psychologist. So I've become interested in psychology through reading novels. English was my favorite subject at school. I did a, a, a sort of strange mix of A-level sciences and then English because I loved it so much. And I just became really interested in, I guess, um, the motivations, the behaviors of the characters in novels. And that kind of led me into psychology. And I did uh, an undergraduate degree in experimental psychology. So, um, you know, I was very much on a path to becoming a clinical psychologist. At the end of the undergraduate degree, you can do a two year professional qualification in clinical psychology. Yeah. But I think they realize and I realized it myself. You actually need some life experience at 21. You don't often you know, start that course in clinical psychology. You really do need to go off and, and get some world experience. And I'd done a lot of voluntary work at that stage. I'd worked in a um, hostel for homeless women who had addictions, mm. and I worked in a day center for homeless people. And then when I graduated, I got a job in a psychiatric hospital to get some experience. And it was, well, it was a fantastic hospital trust. I don't know if they're called, well, I'm sure they weren't called hospital trusts then, but it was the uh, Maudsley and Bethlehem Royal Special Health Authority. And I worked for a year on a mother and baby unit. Wow. So with women who had postpartum psychosis or depression, clinical depression. And uh, it was actually a really, that was a really positive experience. They could stay in the hospital up to six months, but you really did see them improving and they were generally discharged and went home within that six month period. Now they may, uh, through another life event, end up having an episode again, but it was great to sort of see that recovery. And I was afforded, you know, all sorts of rights. I sat in on therapy sessions. I ran a projective art group, mm. uh, you know, it was fantastic. But after that, I worked, um, I did a short stint with people who had been in long-term mental institutions who were now being moved into the community. And that was actually a much more difficult undertaking, actually. And at the end of that, 
you know, I'm still in my early 20s here. I thought, I'm not sure this is for me or I'm not sure this is for me now. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, so I then took a, a different path. And I know we might talk a little bit about about that later. But yeah, I mean, for many years, that that was uh, really what I wanted to be. Wow. That's incredible, Paula. I think that kind of situation and those experiences will hopefully mean that you're a lot more empathetic and forgiving and um, understanding of different people's situations. Mm. Like you said, when when you sometimes just come out of uni, you you have experiences up to the point of when you're in uni and whatever there may have been before. Mm. But to continue your learning like that and to meet such a wide variety of people and learn from them, that really is quite something. And that mm. I'm sure is probably something that has really allowed you continue to um, allow you to move forward in your life with a very different perspective than other people. Mm. Especially because that the mother baby unit time, mm. you know, it's 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 really only something that's in the past, I think even 10 years, the um, the depression that some women can have mm. after they have a baby is really starting to be recognized. I remember plenty of um, TV series, um, soaps, mm. for example, TV soaps, as they say here in the UK, um, long running TV shows that have ad- tried to address this to raise awareness of it in the last 10 years. Mm. Um, so that's gosh wow yeah and that the hospitals Maudsley and Bethlehem Royal they were very much ahead of the time and I I know it's a, it is more widely known about now and you still hear that it's really difficult for women to get a place on a unit like that uh, so it was extraordinary um I mean we're talking God, I don't know, 25 years more I can't even quite you know but we're talking a very long time ago mm. and um it's pretty dreadful that people are still finding it difficult to get those places because the whole point is the women can ensure they're keeping that connection with their baby you know developing that bond they may not be able to look after the baby at that point and there were nursery nurses there taking that role on if they had to but the baby was still there still with them they had that opportunity uh, it wasn't broken. So, no, it was it was incredible. But, yeah, I mean, I was doing suicide watches. It was, it, yeah, you kind of get on with it. It's like anything. When you're in that situation, you know, day to day, you're working in a role like that. You just keep going. You get on with it. And I, yeah, I learned so much. I, I have to say, I do smile wryly on, on the few job interviews I've had when people say, do you think you'll be able to cope with the difficult characters in publishing? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably won't Probably be too okay. bad. Yeah. <laughs> I think I've had some good grounding for that. Yeah, I think we'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if you were to have dinner tonight with anybody in the world, regardless of whether they are dead, alive, whoever they are or whoever they would be and you can have as many people as you want we don't limit you on you know how many um with any of these questions really um so who would it be well my immediate instinctive answer to this was nigella nigella laws (laughs) because undoubtedly exactly i love her she'd undoubtedly be happy to do the cooking um And I love her. I love her books. I love her shows. And the books, are they're about the cooking, but they're not about the cooking. They're they're literary. They are so beautifully written. And yeah, the micro wave was transcendent. But that's like a a, a in-house family joke that they they just said. And then everyone's like, oh, Nigella says it's like this. It's like, it's great. (laughs) Exactly. I, I absolutely love her. So I thought, well, she could do the cooking. And then I did hope you were letting me have a couple more people. So oh, yeah. I, I, you know, I feeling now aligned with Nigella. So then I thought we, you know, me and Nige, <laughs> Nigella could, <laughs> could invite... <laughs> Could could invite Mary Wollstonecraft. So I don't know if you've come across her, but she, yeah, great. So a feminist, a writer, a philosopher, late 18th century, such an advocate for girls' education. And uh, and she had a very interesting kind of personal life, a bit ahead of her time in that respect as well. <laughs> Lots of affairs. Um, you know, she she was a woman ahead of her time, and I'd love her to be there. And then I would also love uh, to have contemporary author Bernadine Evaristo. Have you read any of her novels? 
So she won the Booker Prize a couple of years ago for Girl, Woman, Other, uh, which is a brilliant book. So it follows the lives of 12 characters, 12 women whose lives interweave. And when I read um, an, or, or a book by an author I really love, then I say, oh, I must go and read all their backlist. So I have been going through all her backlist. Wow. And it's just, they're just brilliant. And I can't believe I haven't read them before. So there's Mr. Lover Man, which is about a guy from the West Indies, Barrington. He's been married for years. But he's got a male lover, but he can't acknowledge um, that he's gay. He just can't be true to himself. It's a very serious novel, but it's hilarious. It's, what, it's laugh out loud as well. That's brilliant. And then Blonde Roots, which is about the whole world turned upside down. And it's looking at the slave trade where white people were, ensla were enslaved by black people, which, yeah. you know, makes you think and see things from such a different perspective. And I'm just starting to read another one of her books, Soul Tourist. So I, I thought me and Nigella, Bernadine and Mary, that's my list. <laughs> There are some conversations to be had at that table. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> I love it. That is brilliant. Um, so with your professional side on now, um, tell me about your career and how you got to where you are today. Mm. Right. Well, I guess going back to that earlier conversation, you know, where I'd worked in the psychiatric hospital, I'd worked in the community, um, and then I thought, this isn't for me. Clinical psychology is not for me. Well, what am I now going to do? I have no idea. So I thought about other elements of my previous studying. And when I did my psychology degree, I'd taken a module in artificial intelligence. I mean, it was very embryonic at the time, but I'd really enjoyed it. And so I thought, right, let me do a postgraduate degree uh, it was really a conversion course. So essentially, it's a one-year computer science conversion course where you pack in a three-year computer science degree. It's a bit like doing a law conversion. I, I don't know if they still do them. But um, yeah, that's what I did. And uh, it was really very intense. And I think there was a bit of me after my previous experiences that wanted to hide behind a computer screen. You know, I thought, after those difficult situations, you know, maybe I don't want to speak to people. I don't want to deal with people. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, it's not been like that at all. Of course, it didn't work out <laughs> at all like that, <laughs> which I'm very pleased about, really. But I, yeah, I think there was a bit of me. I mean, yeah, I was really interested in AI, but there was a little bit of that going on. Yeah. Let's move on to something completely different. And then when I uh, finished that postgraduate uh, degree, I applied for jobs as a programmer and I was offered a couple of jobs. And this was a fork in the road because one of the jobs was with the NHS. And that, in a way, would have been my comfort zone. Oh, I've worked in a hospital. I've worked in the community via the National Health Service. But the other job was Longman. And it was as a Vista programmer, which many publishing uh, people will have heard of, Vista. Yes, I remember that, yeah. Yeah. And I thought, no, I'm not going for the comfort zone. I'm going for Longman. I don't know anything about publishing. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to opt for that. And I have to say, I'm so delighted I did because I feel like I found my niche and I've kind of never looked back. And that work at Longman was, oh, it's a fantastic company. And as you know, it became Pearson. I'm sure it's still a fantastic company, but I was afforded all sorts of opportunities. I only did the computer programming for one year. And I was chatting to a friend of mine. He started on the same day as me at Longman, Alan Cohen. And he reminded me the other day that I, I developed a gross profit for journal system in that year. Wow. And I, I cannot believe it because I'd completely forgotten about it. And there's no way I could do it now, that's for sure. So I was rather impressed. Um, yeah. <laughs> So after a year of that, I was then asked to join uh, a big project, um, a customer services project as a systems analyst. And I did that for a year. Uh, and then I was asked to become a project manager. And it was amazing. <clears throat> it was this sort of, I guess, the main upwards trajectory of my career. So I am really grateful to Pier Pearson for this. And I ran two publishing systems projects, one for the higher ed division which is where I first met Jill Jones, actually, and one for the English language teaching division. And it was all about selecting and implementing applications that covered the entire publishing life cycle. 
So uh, again, I did that for about a year. And then there was an opening for the role of development manager. And I got I got the job. I inherited a team. So that was my first experience of managing people, which yeah. I really, really did love. And I did that for a few years. And then my last role at Pearson was new media manager, which is such a funny title, though, Lou, isn't it now? It is now. It was probably it absolutely spot on then. It was. It was absolutely spot on. And that was um, the role where I worked with Jill very closely um, on the ebook list, on the di digital rights management, on a virtual teacher prototype. Um, it was it was fantastic. So it was spot on. But it does make me smile a little bit now to think that that, that was called new media. Um, and then I was offered a role at Random House and I jumped at it because I thought, great, this is now an opportunity to learn about trade publishing. Yeah. And I'd spent a number of years in academic publishing. So this was a really good opportunity. And it was as director of publishing systems. Mm. So I was responsible for all solutions for publishing, editorial, sales, marketing, publicity, um, rights, actually, and royalties. And, and again, actually, soon after joining there, we published the first uh, Random House eBooks list. So a bit of a theme going on. Um, and then we were looking for a publishing system for the organization. We'd recently merged with Transworld. Yeah. And, and I realized, you know, sometimes projects are more than just what they appear to be. So oh, yes, this was, yes. Yeah, this was for a publishing system, but it was also about bringing the two companies together, unifying them, consolidating processes and systems. So it really mattered. And I was directing that project. We had a project team from Random House and a project team from Transworld working together, um, you know, really doing our best. But we both, both sets had allegiances. And, um, and then one day I came across a small company called Virtue Cells. I don't know if you've come across them. They developed um, a publishing solution called Biblio. And at that time, it was a very embryonic system. It was just title management. But I invited them to come and talk to us as a group. And it was a moment of unification where we felt completely inspired. This is, this is the team. These are the people who are going to make this project you know, a success. And they're going to bring the companies together in terms of how they work, processes, and so on. And it was a big risk because the company had five people in it at that time. And we did everything we could to mitigate that risk, but we did we did opt to work with them, yeah. and it it went extremely well. It went live. It must have been about two thousand and four, two thousand and five, um, and and yeah, that was I guess one of my I suppose big successes at Random House. I mean, there were lots of other systems that, that we rolled out, and I had a fantastic time there. Yeah. And then I moved from Random House to Macmillan Science and Education. Uh, as uh, director of business systems globally. And uh, the Random House Group role had been very UK focused. So the Macmillan role was appealing because it was global. And I was um, asked to take on board all development for, for, for Macmillan globally. Mm -hmm. And it was a role I could shape. I had to go in. There had not really been a predecessor. So I had to design the organizational structure, build the team uh -huh. uh, that covered editorial and production, customer engagement, supply chain, finance, reporting. And it was transformative. There were about six people in my team when I joined. And I think there was about 100 at the end because we'd centralized technology. We'd recruited, come up with our technology um, strategy and our roadmap that Annette and Steve Devlin, who was the CTO, I should um, also say he's a very inspirational character. I worked very closely with Steve and Annette. They ratified that uh, roadmap and then the team just duly got on and, and delivered. And it was it was so exciting. It, it was it was a great joy, actually, to work for Macmillan um, and to work with Steve and Annette, I have to say. And I learned loads about running a global team um, and implementing global solutions yeah. and, and when you can centralize and when you need something different, when you need localizations, when you can't all work on the same um, system or application. So, so that, that was great. And then we merged with Springer to become Springer Nature. Yeah. And that, um, 
well, that was very interesting. I carried on for another couple of years, actually, um, doing a similar role. I inherited some lovely people uh, into the team from 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 Springer. Yeah. Have you been through a merger, Lou? Because they're they're very, yes. they can be very difficult. Well, um, acquisitions, yes, I, yeah. I have, yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I mean, they, they, yeah, they, they are. I mean, it, but it was so um, fascinating um, to, you know, negotiate one, one's time through that and maneuver yeah. through it. So I learned an awful lot. Yeah, there was a massive cultural shift and a massive system merger consolidation program. Yeah. So for me, it was a great learning experience. Um, and yeah, after a couple of years uh, doing that, I got a very interesting and appealing, but slightly daunting opportunity, <laughs> which was, uh, I was asked by Mark DeFoss, the founder of Ribbonfish, whom I think you've met, um, yeah. Lou, as well. Yeah. And he asked me if I would yeah, become CEO of, of Ribbonfish. So this was quite sort of left field, really, I have to say. Um, and I, I'd known Mark, I'd known some of the Ribbonfish team for years, actually, at that point. They'd done a lot of work for Macmillan. They'd developed uh, title management solutions for Palgrave, the academic division, for the language learning division. They supported lots of Macmillan systems. We'd chosen Salesforce as our global CRM, and they had rolled that out to our New York um, and North America offices uh, to 800 users. So, so I, knew them, I knew them very well. Uh, there were a number of elements to this offer that were, were within my comfort zone. So running a technology team focused on publishing, a number of people in the team I knew. Um, the company had a lot of integrity, went the extra mile, and that, that all fitted with my ethos. But I knew this was going to be very different, you know, being on the vendor side, and you're smiling there. Um, you oh, know yeah. exactly what I mean. I, I love client side, but yes, you do have more opportunities to get involved in more and exciting projects that you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't be able to do being client side yeah yeah and there's swings and roundabouts isn't there for both of them there, there are and i'd this, this is this might be quite interesting to you i particularly wondered about the marketing and the sales bit that i would now be responsible for because of course running a division or a department on the customer side i thought well i haven't really done that how am i going to do it and and then I realized I actually had loads of experience in those disciplines because I would go to board meetings and pitch internally yeah. uh, and I would present what projects we should be doing, the benefits, the timelines, the costs. And I was basically pitching to get the budget to take back to my team for us to then run with those projects. And, and it, in a way, it's exactly the same now. That was selling, I think. And I'm I, yeah, so I was selling to, to my own CEO or my own marketing director or my own sales director. Uh, yeah, and now I'm, I'm doing it. Okay, they're not my team, but it's the same milieu. They're the same types of people. So I, yeah. yeah. It doesn't have to be an internal team. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I kind of then rationalized it and realized, yeah, okay, this is going to be fine. Yeah. And so I went for it. I jumped ship and went for it. And I've been there four years or here now, four years. I can't believe, I, I think I thought I'll do this for a year. You know, I'll see how it goes. <laughs> and um, four years later, we'll be speaking in another five years and you're like, here I am, nine years I'm, later. <laughs> I know, I think I will. But I do love it. And as, as you know, you can pivot to new things really quickly, as you were implying, you know, it, you can be dynamic. Um, it can be really great fun. You can make decisions quite swiftly. There isn't so much red tape. There's, there's a lot, you know, there really is a lot going for it. And Mark and I have got really complementary skills. So I think it, it works um, very well between us. So we are quite different people. We have different ways of working. But I think we agree fundamentally that what we want to do is provide a great experience for our customers. We want to go above and beyond. Uh, and that's what we're all about. So, so I think we've really got the same kind of ethos. Um, so, so, so yeah, so, so here I am four years in and, you know, very much growing, 
growing the team. And we're working with some fantastic customers. Yeah. So we've got long-term customers like Macmillan Learning in New York, um, Saga, Bujbal, the CTO, and Andrew Crenshaw, customer um, engagement solutions director. You know, they've got such vision. Yeah. So we, you know, we learn from them. They learn from us. Uh, great marketing and sales directors, inspirational people like Katie Hope at Princeton University Press and Joe Gregg at Bristol University Press. Yeah. And then well, great business services directors, Jenny Hills. I don't know if you know Jenny at British Medical Journal. She just wants to get things done. You know, <laughs> they're all very different, but I, I do, you know, I think they learn from me and I, I'm very empathetic to them because I've been there in their positions. Uh, but yeah, we learn from them too. So, and we're working at the moment with um, wonderful people at Emerald um, and we're really helping them drive their uh, strategic roadmap. So, I, yeah, I think I will be here in five years' time. Emerald are always doing something impressive. Um, yes. And yeah, and, it, and you're certainly right. There is a lot to be said for when you work service side like ourselves. Um, and you are a smaller, more niche organization, you have that ability to be agile and you can also respond to things more rapidly, rapidly and you can shift resources around and change things as you need to. And not everybody is cut out to be to work in a smaller organization because some people are very, this is my job, this is my description and this is what I expect to be doing. But actually in a smaller organization, because you have to be agile, because you can be, and that's one of the most attractive features for clients, is that you'll probably do some stuff that you you had done years and years ago, but you're doing it now. It's just the way it is. And the red tape, yeah. that's the great thing is that, you know, the buck normally stops with me. So if there's any red tape, it's me that's made them. Mm -hmm. um, but that's highly unlikely. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, so... In terms of your career, then, what are you most proud of? Yeah. I think you've well, got a lot to be proud of. <laughs> uh, I think the thing I'm most proud of, and it's a fairly recent thing, and it's uh, the fact that we are a, a product company. So we've built um, a rights licensing solution for publishers. It's called Rightzone. And we've done that. So uh, I've been heavily involved, Mark, of course, and Alex Cap from Ribbonfish. And we've worked with two wonderful people, Ruth Tellis and Claire Hodder, uh, their rights consultants. And we've come together and we have developed this amazing product called Right Zone. Mark is very, very creative. And he um, decided early on, we really should build this system on the Salesforce platform which is fabulous. It's absolutely fabulous. I mean, it's so easy to use. It streamlines the process. Uh, I mean, it's a great product. And we now have about 15 publishers uh, using it. And uh, we are marching forward at a pace. And yeah, I was quite, because we had a meeting the other day and I thought, oh, 50, yeah, I hadn't quite, you know, hadn't quite realized that. Um, and that's really exciting because yeah. I do think technology is actually really creative. Yeah. I think some people don't realize that. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think it isn't always creative, but it absolutely can be. And it feel, yeah, I feel really proud to be part of that group and that team. And that we have, you know, created something that I think is making uh, the lives of the rights teams within publishers so much better. It really is facilitating that and it's helping them grow, grow their right sales. So, yeah, I'm feeling and it's yeah, it's topical. So I'm, I'm yeah. feeling very positive about it. That's fantastic, though, because that's also impact of what has been produced that is measured and so to be able to say, wow, you know, we've got 15 organizations that have adopted this now, you know, you're on to the right thing. It's not just mm. someone's adopted it and piloting it. It's actually people are buying into the idea. And for to be fair, I think, you know, technology is incredibly creative, but it's also mm. very, very fast paced. And for me, one of the most important things when you think about technology is interoperability is a fact mm. of integrating with systems that are already there that some people are very brand loyal to, or it's inherently difficult for them to move away from it anytime soon. 
but to provide a solution that's integrated with something that is mm. such a stable in many organizations um, technology tools that's very very important because mm. you don't want to have to have another system that then you have to get it to talk to something oh, it's just you know we all know mm. it's a nightmare Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you've put it really well there. Salesforce is architected so incredibly well. I mean, it's so performant globally. Yeah. Uh, there are no, there's no issue around global teams using it. Um, the performance is fantastic. The UI is fantastic. So there's a lot going for it. And you can then build more quickly. You can do the creative bits then on top of that. You know, you don't have to start thinking about the architectural foundations uh, yeah. and you can yeah really ensure it's customized to meet the needs of of uh, the people who are going to be using it and hence that sense that we were working with the rights professionals Claire and Ruth I don't think it's for us as technologists I mean it can be obviously it depends on the project but you know you really want to work with the business and that's always yeah. been sort of my mantra and you need those specialist skill sets and you bring them in as and when you need them. But to have that depth of experience and people to ask you questions that you suddenly go, you're right. I didn't think about that. Mm. So what have you found then that's been apart from uh, and this may actually I may be even telling you your answer here. Uh, but apart from what you went um, that you experienced when you changed your career from where you were working on the psychology side to working with helping to rehabilitate people back into the community who had been in um, mm. facilities long term, which must have been just very challenging, rewarding in some respects mm. and in others, certainly not. Um, what have you found most challenging in your career? You're right uh, about uh, what you know what you've just talked around there in terms of the psychology career. I think in terms of my subsequent career, I have occasionally found myself in chauvinistic environments, and so I have found that challenging. Um, and as I'm sure you're aware, women in technology. Um, there's not so many of us. Uh, there's certainly more now um, than there used to be. And so I have occasionally, but I mean very occasionally, um, found myself in those kind of chauvinistic setups. I think that my career has been a bit of a dream on the whole. Uh, but sometimes you'll find yourself working with somebody who doesn't play by the rules. Well, yeah. the rules as I know them. And um, and you've got to think laterally about how to deal with that. Yeah. And, and luckily, a number of years ago, I had a, a fantastic work coach uh, who did help me through that. Um, his name's Jerry Gray. Um, and as I say, he was my work coach, but he also coaches. He's a great man. He's inspiring, too. He coaches prisoners, goes into prisoners and provides that service. Um, and. And he also coaches um, people who've recently left prison who are on probation. But yeah, he is, uh, you know, a work coach too. And um, I found it immensely rewarding, you know, working with him. I think learning that you have to think differently. If you keep repeating the same pattern, it's not going to work. And if other, somebody else or other people aren't playing by the rules, and you are because, you know, I'm that kind of person, yeah. how do you... How do you break that? How do you move forward? And you can't necessarily change them. You've got to kind of work it through um, yourself and, and how you're going to react to it, really. So I think, yeah, I, I think that, that that's that been a little bit challenging. But a number of years ago, and, and generally, it has not been like that. But I think perhaps we all find ourselves occasionally in those sorts of setups. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny you mention that because when I sometimes speak to um, professionals who are wanting to move up the ladder and they're, they're gunning for a more senior position and maybe an executive position. And sometimes the thing that's holding them back is how they're dealing with situations with difficult people or mm. politics or red tape and how to navigate a way around that. And I think sometimes that comes from experience. And, you know, for me, the biggest change in my life was a few years ago when I realized that by continually putting my own expectations on other people 
was pointless because sometimes those people were never going to change Mm. were always going to remain the same and actually if I didn't put my expectations specific expectations on them I found that actually they didn't disappoint me and um, if they did something that was really good I was even more pleasantly surprised and it completely changed my outlook and the way that I thought about things and like you I'm a problem solver so I want to work out okay this is blocking me right now this is Mm. stopping me from moving forward what do I need to do to get around it, to go through it, to help them to address whatever their issue is so that we can all just move forward together? Because often it is that understanding what it is that's preventing them. And sometimes it's something as simple as actually just creating a relationship with that person, finding some common ground, mm. and then having a better relationship where you talk about things and then they're a lot more approachable and they be, don't become a blocker anymore, but an enabler. So, yeah, Mm. it's a fascinating, fascinating um, situation. Yeah, I think you put that really eloquently. And and it's exactly that. You cannot, I mean, they may change, but you cannot have the expectation that they will change. And it is very easy to get into that pattern. And, And as you say, you've really got to break that pattern. And it's about how you react to things. And I completely agree with you. I have a business coach as well. And he's a, a record breaking athlete and he's um, he's a, a, an executive business coach. And he's you know, he asks me difficult questions. He makes me think about things that no one else asks me or I have time to mm. think about. And I think when you have someone there that just takes you either out of your comfort zone, it's like Zoe Loveland had said, nothing grows in your comfort zone. So even if you take a little bit of a step out, you're still growing. Mm. And so I think. Um, and he he focuses my attention because you know what it's like. We're incredibly mm. busy. Everyone's so busy that to just take you out and say, I want you to spend the next hour focusing on this. Then you come out of mm. it like just like with a very different perspective. Mm. Yeah, you're forced to set aside that time. Absolutely. Which is very important. Mm. So, well, I mean, this could be it. But unless you want to become a founder yourself, mm-hmm. what is your ultimate career goal? <laughs> yeah, and and I think yeah, you're right. I want to continue to grow ribbon fish. So um, that's the plan. I want to continue to deliver for our publishers and our customers. But your question did make me think, though. Do I want to come full circle back to psychology? Yeah. Uh, I don't know the answer to that actually. Um, And I'd say for now, I'm happy doing what I am doing. But your questions have, you know, really brought things up for me and made me think about that. (laughs) Not imminent. Absolutely not imminent. (laughs) Because of the the type of work that you're doing, and because you're providing publishing automation solutions, part of that, when you look at it from a marketing automation perspective, is like personas. So it Mm. is thinking about that psychology of why do people do what they do, thinking about the customer journey, thinking about user behavior. Mm. But there is definitely a way that you can use that experience to grow and develop other parts of ribbon fish. Yeah, I I absolutely love that element, the whole motivations, the behaviors. Yeah. (laughs) Fantastic. And you've got scope to do it with your current organization. So what better? Yeah. Um. So they go, Mark, just in case Mark was watching, <laughs> worry. Um, so if you weren't doing the role that you're doing now and money was absolutely mm-hmm. no object at all, you know, you just you won the Euro millions and you just won <laughs> hundreds of millions of pounds sterling, um, what would you be? Well, I think if I, if I weren't working or I were working less, I would be more active on social issues. So it wouldn't be so much, um, you know, what would I be? Um, But I would get much more involved again in voluntary work and engaging more in politics around sort of anti-racist issues and equality for women. You know, I would, yeah, I would spend a lot of time devoted, I think, to, to those causes. Yeah. Yeah. Very important. And the more people that get involved and the more people that take notice of 
what's important for them that's where we get this progressive positive mm-hmm. change that happens that we can help to drive forward um yeah it's a very um we just sometimes it's you know boring that we have to do work to get paid mm. um but that is life but to be mm. able to actually be able to concentrate and take time to do that is would be something quite special that's certainly an, a, an excellent use of your time <laughs> so um now i o- often ask mm. this question and then people say to me well i don't read professional <laughs> books i have i I listen to podcasts, I read blog posts instead, because, you know, we, I prefer more digestible yeah. content. So we normally ask which inspiring three professional books um, would you recommend? But it may not be books. It could be any content. Of mm. And yeah, it's funny. You're right that in recent times, I haven't read a plethora or a myriad of uh, professional myriad, books. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I do read blogs. I I read uh, research articles. And when I saw this question, I I thought I'd mention one that I read a few months ago in Nature. I really liked it. I really related to it. And it showed that when people want to improve something, uh, whatever that is, so whatever the context, um, whether it's a situation, a process, a system or whatever, people look to add something they look to add another element in systems terms. You know, they want more data. Um, (laughs) That's a a very usual thing, whether it helps or not. So rather than removing something, so these were observational studies and they were focused on um, engineering, but um, the writers acknowledge this is something that seems to happen in all sorts of spheres. So you know, in cooking, you think, oh, let's add another spice, not, oh, next time I cook this, I'm going to remove something. And I think in technology, this happens so often. Uh, if you're looking to improve a specification, a system, a workflow, we're really additive by nature. Well, let's yeah. make it even more complicated. Let's add something rather than let's stand back and really think about how we can perhaps streamline this. Can we remove something? So I thought it was fascinating. And it's that old adage of less is more sometimes. And um, I noted um, that uh, one of the researchers has got a book coming out. I think it probably is out now. So it's a professional book, I guess, that I will be reading. And I did note it down. It's called, um, I think it's something like Subtract the untapped science of less. So I will, I I will let you know, um, Lou, because I certainly want to read that. I think it's a really interesting perspective that we assume adding things will improve things. So I, yeah, I like, I like to think of that in a different way going forward. I think that's an absolutely fascinating perspective. And it's funny because as you were saying that, I was thinking that um, an organization, a small organization I used to work for, When they recruited um, the head of development, he came with a specific mindset and he was saying, um, you know, when when people register for the service, they should, we should just be asking them for only the basic information that that they need. Mm -hmm. Whereas we're inherently so used to asking for as much information as you can. It's like you say, you know, it's comforting to know the data's Mm -hmm. there, but actually what are you doing with it? And I think that's one of the interesting things when we've had changes in legislation through the last few years, and like GDPR, for example, is you only ask for the data that you really need. And actually, Mm. are you asking for data that you're never going to need? But the interesting thing, when you look at a customer journey and you think of the touch points of when a customer is going through that journey, as you require data, you can ask them at various touch points, but you want the flow and the process to be as easy as possible. And when Ryan had said that back then, and my mind was, you know, different mindset, I was so used to registration forms, you know, asking specific things. And I was thinking, oh God, but he was so right in terms Mm. of just saying, just make it simple and easy for people to register. So then you're encouraging more registration. Mm And then only ask them for the information that you really need. For example, what's going to validate them, what's going to authenticate them, and then ask for other things as you need to. Um, so, yeah, and, and that's been really fascinating to watch over the last 10 years, because mm. this was about 10 years ago, how, how it's changed. And there must be so much data out there and storage that's been paid for for stuff mm. 
that never gets touched and it's a nice to have, but it's not a must have. Yeah, completely agree. Uh, Prioritisation is key. I mean, you need to look at data as it is a really valuable commercial asset. Yeah. But you'll you'll never get it completely right. You'll never you'll never think you've got enough data. You'll no. never think it's clean enough. You'll never think it's enriched enough. It's about priorities and and it, yeah, less is more. I, yeah, I well, really think it is rather than yeah. Quality, yeah. What is really going to make a difference? You know, in terms of generating leads or um, I don't know whatever it is. Yeah, but yeah. really pinpoint that and prioritize that. And like I said, you know, there can be other points in the journey where you can capture other data when you realize, ah, we didn't spec this out. This should have also been included. Mm. So, you know, there's always ways that you can change it. It doesn't mean it has to stay Mm. like that. So. um, So what's your most favorite book or podcast or blog and why? (laughs) Yeah, I was. uh able to answer this immediately. Um, so I have a favorite novel, which I read initially when I was a teenager. I've read I'm a bit of a precocious teenager, I think. I've read it a few times since. And it's, um, it's called The Idiot by Dostoevsky, because I absolutely love Russian literature. Yeah. And um, The Idiot in question is the central character, Prince Mishkin. And I mean, he's not an idiot at all, uh, he, but he's very good hearted. He's very simple in his needs and in his desires. And people make assumptions that he's not intelligent. He's drawn into all sorts of difficult, terrible situations. And I don't know if you read much Russian literature, but there are always massive themes, you know, life and death, innocence and guilt. <laughs> Black and white. Capital punishment or not capital yeah, punishment. Right Atheism white. or religion. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's got everything really. Um, and yeah, I, I, I just love it. I mean, it's beautifully written. It's, it's very interesting structurally. I, I, I'm very drawn to that idea that people seem to think that kind hearted people who have those simple needs and not intelligent yeah. and it's really shocking yeah yeah and um yeah so it really kind of brings brings that to life so that is my favorite novel fantastic and was it written in russian and translated into mm. english yeah oh, wow. yeah I wonder, that must have been very interesting for whoever was translating it to make sure that it comes across because obviously when you write something in some language, like Russian, mm. for example, translating it into English doesn't always, you know, you just don't get quite the same. It just doesn't quite read the same, but it's wonderful to hear yeah. this could be written. So um, someone obviously did you're not write right. that. You're right, you're right. I mean, it was written in oh, late 19th century. So yeah. there've been a number of translations, but you're so right to point out the translation is absolutely key. I mean, in that work, but in so many uh, and it can make a, a massive difference. So, yeah, like I think the there have been many translations. Sorry, Lou. It's a bit like the translator is the author mm, mm. rather than, you know, they've, they've had like a some context of what the story is about. But actually, so you're actually reading the translator's version. Mm. Yeah, it's a massive contribution, I think, the translator. So really anything is. that you talk to us about, we provide a link to. So, mm. um anything like that we'll be providing a link to. Um, So if you could travel back in a time machine, what would you tell your early career self? I would tell myself, go with your instincts. Uh, And I think I've now got the confidence to do that. And they're not always right, but they very often are right. And I sometimes did not have the confidence to go with my instincts when I was younger. So, uh, but when I look back, you know, I really should have, I should have pushed it and I should have gone with them. So that, that would be my piece of advice to my younger self. Perfect. I think part of that's confidence, isn't it? And mm. when I've asked that oh, question, yeah. a, lot, a lot of people have said that confidence side, it's, it's confidence in yourself, isn't mm. it? And mm. it's knowing that actually, and like you said, do you know it's fine to make mistakes because that's how we learn at the end of the day. The mm. problem is if you continually make the same mistakes, then you're not really learning. 
So, you know, what do they say? There's some saying when they say, um, do it once, do it once more for you, do it twice more for me or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I know I know what you mean. You know mean. what I, I mean. Know just, oh, knows. completely. Yeah. And it is all about confidence. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And just being happy to step forward and, and push it. I think I've always been willing to say what I think. Yeah. Um, and it, and it often is instinctive, uh, but it's been hard to push that sometimes in the past, in the early days. But now, yeah, I absolutely feel confident enough to go for it. But I think also earlier on in our careers, Paula, when you talked about that more chauvinist environment, mm. you know, we've been going through the careers at the same sort of time. It's, it is very... Um, you know that you your confidence and things do get knocked and it is mm -hmm. something that comes with experience and I think there's a lot of things that we've experienced and certainly people who've had careers pr prior to us you know years prior to us that have experienced some things that really have mm. have um shaped who we are today I think I remember in one of these other interviews we do Mary Sour Games talks about when she started her career she was in Detroit uh, Michigan she started in the um automotive industry and you can imagine mm. that that would have been incredibly chauvinistic. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's um, it, it's all things that help us and shape us as people. Yeah, and, you know. I agree. I think we've been blessed, really, working in publishing, I have to yeah. say. And they're, you know, such central figures that are women, such strong women, you know, that I've talked about who have inspired me. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think we have been blessed, definitely. I think we're incredibly lucky with this highly complex industry that we're in mm. of all the different types of people that we have the um, absolute pleasure of meeting and working with and just being involved with. I think it's it's a fantastic industry, specifically for me, the academic publishing side, because that's where I've you know mm. gone off and focused. But publishing is just so complex. Mm. And so many stakeholders and such a massive ecosystem. Um, so what's the best piece of advice that you have ever been given? Mm. Well, this was from Steve Devlin. I've mentioned him earlier, CTO at Macmillan Science and Education. And he said, do more of what you enjoy. And he meant that in a work context. I mean, I think it's a pretty good adage you know, to, yeah. to live your life by. Um, and he certainly didn't mean don't um, do the things that you don't enjoy. We all have to do things we of don't course. enjoy. <laughs> so it wasn't that simple. But I, I just always remember that. And I do try and um, sort of bring myself back to it uh, because I think you do need to play to your strengths and you ne do need to focus on things that you enjoy. If you enjoy them, they're likely, uh, you're likely to be more productive um, and, and so that's a kind of win-win situation, you know, for you on whatever project it is that you're working on. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think you do need to find some of those things and you do need to embrace them. And yeah, then you actually don't mind doing some of the stuff that you don't like doing so much. Yeah, absolutely. Because it, it gives you that passion and it makes you want to get out of bed and do your job. And like mm. you said, we all have stuff, but like I hate doing admin. Yeah. But we all have, you know admin that we have to do or things that we have to do that we don't like and you just get on and do it because you know mm. and you can go and do the fun stuff that you do yeah like. um so what is your um so obviously through your career you have um worked with marketers mm. and um you obviously have marketers in your team and then as well as your clients um you're mm. generally working with sales and marketing professionals as well so what is your number one tip especially, mm -hmm. I think, interesting coming from the publishing automation background. What's your number one tip for anyone working in marketing right now? Mm. Well, I think we've, we did just touch on this. I mean, I would actually give them the generic advice I've just talked about. Trust your instincts and do more of what you enjoy and, and, then, and be proud of what you do. Um, and then I would just bring it back to prioritizing. And it's very much, of course, about nurturing leads and generating leads and really think about what you need in terms of data to actually enable that, to actually move the company that you're working for forward commercially. 
Yes. And that whole less is more adage. Do not think you can boil the ocean. <laughs> you, know, you have to start somewhere. Uh, don't, don't end up at an impasse or you know, paralysis analysis. Just actually go for it. Start somewhere um, and come up with a list of priorities and uh, just go from there. And, and I'm not saying don't think strategically. You can work in tandem. You can think strategically but you can come up with your priorities and you can start and you can get going and you can make a difference. Yeah, I think that's an incredibly valuable lesson for people is that sometimes people focus so much on the strategic side, they get lost in that without mm. then starting to just get things done. So you have mm. to have a balance. And I do meet a lot of marketeers, more junior marketeers who are so incredibly tactical and don't yet have the knowledge or skill set to think more strategically. But when you do get that skill set, it completely changes you as, a, as an individual. And when you can find that balance um, and you just get stuff done, mm. absolutely. And yeah, multi-pronged, multi-pronged attack, definitely. Yeah. yeah. As otherwise, mm. you just get stuck in some cycle that you're just not ever getting anything done and you're not motivated. Mm. So... What is the thing that you miss since we've had the COVID-19? <laughs> but, you know, one day this question won't be relevant anymore, yeah. but a year and a half later it still is. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, well, I, I have started socialising again. Um, I think most people have now. And I felt very energised by it. Um, I... I spent lockdown with my partner and my daughter and, and I am quite self-contained. I am quite content and I thought I was okay. And then it's only when I started to socialize again that I realized I'd been sort of living a half life, I think. Um, and, you know, I really now do appreciate every kind of social interaction that I have. So I didn't realize I was missing it. But I definitely, definitely was, and I've embraced it, you know, or I am embracing it wholeheartedly. Yeah. I mean, I think very specifics. I mean, I've missed going to galleries and I've missed going to the theatre, but, you know, I'm sure I'm going to start doing those things too. But sometimes it's, that's absolutely right, is that you don't know how much you miss something until you don't have it anymore. Mm. And I think, I hope that we, many of us come out of this situation really valuing a lot more things that we just used to take advantage of, like going to the cinema, going to a mm. library, going to physical spaces. But like mm. you said, that just chatting to a friend face mm -hmm. to face, it's, you know, it's something that you really savor now. And it, and it means a lot. It's really mm. valuable. Um, but yeah, absolutely, completely agree with that. So is there anything that you want to ask me? Uh, yes, which is <laughs> turning that earlier question around to you, I, I guess. What advice would you give technologists from your perspective, you know, from a general business perspective or a specific marketing perspective? What do you think we should be doing? I think, so fortunately, you, you sent me this question over the weekend. Sometimes people say- I'm very nice. <laughs> No, sometimes I ask right at the beginning before we press record, just while we're going through this time that I can suddenly think, oh, my God, what is it? <laughs> but um, no, you're absolutely right. So um, I had time to think about this. And I think for me, my main um, feedback is that you have different departments working in an organization that have specific insights and capabilities. And from some of the best work, and projects that I have been involved with have been involved with IT and with development from a marketing capacity because there is a huge amount of value that marketeers can bring to specific projects especially when it relates to technology because marketeers generally own the customer journey they have specific mm. insights um, they also may have already done personas they may have um, discovered what annoys um, the the uh, the end users, the stakeholders, um, but also not just marketing is the sales departments as well because they're generally the ones that are actually speaking to these people, and so they have really great insights. So for me, it's just ensuring that there's that 
really close collaboration that you're gaining those insights that you want to that someone's just you're having these conversations and I used to go to sprint meetings when platforms were being developed and I was the and I'd been brought into this big society um, and I had a very specific skill set I'd just come from ProQuest and I had a very specific skill set that none of the other marketeers had and um, so for me when I went into those meetings I understood the language no one had to explain anything to me, but I was also as a marketer really eager and, and keen to learn so that I could have um, technological conversations with colleagues. And um, I think that they also really appreciated that I did want to learn and I was bothered about what all these different, the different terminologies and things mean, because ultimately you're going to produce something that's going to be a much better user experience for the end users. And you're going to produce something that you're all going to be incredibly proud of. That's probably my best mm. advice that I can give in that respect. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. I think that working together, you know, that has to be key, doesn't it? Brilliant. It can't be technology led. It can't be completely business led. It is mm. a coming together. And sometimes some of these organizations that you and I work with, they are sales led. They are editorial mm. led. You don't often hear of an organization being marketing led. Mm. But um, and sometimes they yeah, they are technology led. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Just, you know, work together and just ensure that you're getting those key insights early on. And you'll mm. be surprised about how much hassle that saves later on, especially yeah. when something's launched and then it's showcased to various departments. And then they go, mm. why didn't you <laughs> get it? <laughs> It costs an awful lot more to rectify it further down the line. And you want, you know, you want your colleagues when they launch something, everyone to go, wow, amazing. Yeah. of course, there's going to be niggles, right? Mm. Nothing's going to be perfect. But yes, so that's what I would say. Thank you so much. So, Paula, I want to say thank you so, so much for taking the time to talk to us today. It has been absolutely brilliant and fascinating to hear about your career, all the things you've learned, your top tips, and also the resources that you told us about and the things that we should be uh, paying attention to and looking at. That's been my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me.